In video 48 of Tensor Calculus, we'll introduce a new object known as the volume element, and we'll illustrate what its value looks like in each of our sample coordinate systems. We'll also derive an expression for the partial derivative of the volume element with respect to our coordinate value zi. Back in video 46, we derived these relationships. We said that the determinant of a second rank mixed tensor is an invariant quantity, or that it is an absolute tensor of rank zero. However, the determinant of a second rank tensor with two lower indexes like this is a relative tensor of weight two because of this factor with a positive exponent of 2. Likewise, the uh, determinant of a second rank tensor with two upper indexes is a relative tensor of weight negative 2 because of the exponent of this factor right here. Well, today we want to apply these results specifically to our covariant metric tensor. Now, the first thing we'll do is to denote that the letter Z is going to be our way of representing our uh, determinant of our covariant metric tensor like this. So instead of having to write this expression every time, we'll just write the letter Z. And that means, uh, likewise, that Z prime then is going to equal Z with two lower dots with primes on them like so. Well, that's going to make our syntax much simpler. So using these definitions, we can now say that Z prime is equal to J squared times Z because this particular, you know, this relationship right here uh, applies to this model right there. Okay, now, um, next thing we're going to do is we're going to take the square root of both sides of this equation, and we're going to get the square root of z prime is going to be equal to j times the square root of z. And we call this factor, uh, square root of z, we call it the volume element. Now, in other disciplines, such as linear algebra, the Jacobian determinant plays a very important role when it comes to changing or transforming from one coordinate system to another. Well, in tensor calculus, we're going to use the volume element instead of the Jacobian for roughly the same purpose. The uh, volume element, the square root of z, is going to be roughly equivalent to the Jacobian that's used in linear algebra. Now, I say roughly equivalent because there is one important distinction. The Jacobian itself, this uh, determinant of uh, Jacobian J, is something that can be either positive or negative. If um, Z and Z prime have the same orientation, meaning if they're both right-handed or both left-handed, then the Jacobian determinant is going to be positive. If one is left-handed, the other is right-handed, then the Jacobian is going to be negative. To um, review the concept of the orientation of a coordinate system, you might want to go back and, and listen again to video number four. So um, in tensor calculus, we're only interested in a positive value of our square root of z. So what we're going to do is to uh, say that the relationship is related by the absolute value of the Jacobian determine it just like this. And in, in doing that, we'll say that they're related by an orientation-preserving relationship with the Jacobian. So the Jacobian determinant itself can be positive or negative, but our volume element is always positive, or I, I really should say it's non-negative. There are cases where it can be zero, but it's not ever going to be negative. Okay, let's uh, take a few minutes to see what this volume element looks like in each of our sample coordinate systems. We'll start with Cartesian coordinates. 
what we need to do is to find the determinant of our covariant metric tensor. Well, that's easy because uh, it's a diagonal matrix, and the determinant of any diagonal matrix is simply the product of the diagonal elements. So 1 times 1 times 1 is the determinant. Z is equal simply to 1. And, of course, that means that our volume element, square root of Z, is, of course, just 1. So with that, we'll move down and put that in place right here. The volume element in Cartesian coordinates is 1. All right, let's look at affine coordinates. This time we have a 2 by 2 matrix, and the determinant of the, that is going to be this product, a squared, b squared, minus this product, minus a squared, b squared, cosine squared, alpha. And of course, we can factor out the a squared, b squared factors, leaving us with 1 minus cosine squared alpha. And that's, uh, of course, the sine squared of alpha. And that's the value of the determinant of our covariant metric tensor. And that means that our volume element, square root of z, is going to be a, b, sine, alpha. And that's what we get right down here. So the volume element for affine coordinates is simply a, b, sine, alpha. All right, moving on now to plane polar coordinates. All right, this time we're back to a matrix that has only diagonal elements. So we simply multiply the uh, diagonal elements together. So our determinant value is going to be 1 times r squared, or just r squared. And obviously the volume element, square root of z, is equal to r. And our volume element for plane polar coordinates is simply r. All right, uh, next would be cylindrical polar coordinates. Again, we have only diagonal elements, so the determinant value is the product of the three, which is equal to rho squared. And that means our volume element, square root of z, is equal to rho. So that's going to be our volume element for cylindrical polar coordinates. It's simply the value of rho. And finally, we'll finish up with spherical polar coordinates. And here it's the same drill. It's only diagonal elements, so we multiply those together. So the determinant value of our covariant metric tensor is equal to the product of these three factors, which is r to the fourth power times sine squared theta. And, of course, our volume element is the square root of that, which is r squared sine theta. All right, we'll put that in place right down here. Volume element for spherical polar coordinates is r squared sine theta. And with that, uh, we've worked through the volume elements for each of our sample coordinate systems. All right, there's one more thing I want to do. We're going to need to be able to take the partial derivative of this volume element with respect to our coordinate variable. So we'll conclude the video by deriving that relationship. We'll start by finding the partial derivative of our determinant z with respect to zi. Well, how do we do that? Well, remember that a determinant is a function of the elements of the system. In this case, the covariant metric tensor. So we can break this down using the chain rule. We can say that this is the partial derivative of z with respect to our covariant metric tensor, z, j, m. And to complete the chain rule, it's the partial of z, j, m with respect to z, i. All right, now, this chain rule looks a little different than we've seen it before. Normally, it's just done with respect to a 
variable with a single index, but this works too. Uh, the difference here is that this is a double contraction, so there will be nine terms here in this contraction. Well, um, next you'll remember that in the previous video we discovered this relationship, that the cofactor of a system contracted with that system is going to be equal to its determinant times the Kronecker delta. And remember, too, the definition of our cofactor is this. So what we can do is to combine these two to form this relationship. We'll substitute the definition over here. And what we'll have is the partial of A with respect to ARI contracted with ARM is now equal to the determinant times delta im. So this is a relationship that's true of any system that has two lower indexes. Well, that's certainly the case for z up here. It's a determinant with uh, these components in the system. So we can apply this model to this first term. In other words, the partial of z with respect to zri contracted with ZRM is going to be equal to Z times delta IM. So um, this relationship applies to any system with two lower indexes, which certainly um, includes the covariant metric tensor like this. All right, well, the next thing we're going to do is to try to isolate this partial derivative. And we do that by contracting both sides of this expression with a contravariant metric tensor of, uh, in this case, ZMK. So we'll contract both sides of this with contravariant metric tensor ZMK. And we'll have to do that over here, of course, to balance it out. Okay, well on the left side, what you see is that this term and this term together will produce a delta kr. And the r index here will absorb this index. Remember, this is actually an upper index. So this will absorb the r index, leaving us with a k index in this position. And on the right-hand side, the Kronecker delta will absorb the M index, leaving us with an I in this position. So what we wind up with is simply the partial derivative of Z with respect to ZKI being equal to Z times ZIK over here. And that's because the, these two elements form the Kronecker delta that absorb the R index, leaving us with this on the left side. And the M index is absorbed here, leaving us with I there. OK, well, now that we have this relationship, we can use it to replace this factor up here. In other words, this factor is going to be equal to simply Z times Z M J. All right, now that works because uh, you know this is equal to this because this is equal to that. All right, well, what about this other factor over here? Well, we've seen that before back in video number 30, and that's um, simply equal to gamma M J I plus gamma j m i. So now we can continue on to simplify this expression. What we'll do next is to distribute this factor into the, each of these two terms. And when we distribute this into the first term, that contraction will raise the m index, leaving us with j. When we distribute it over here, that will be a contraction on the J index that will raise J up, leaving us M up here. 
So we're going to see that the partial of z with respect to zi is now equal to factor of z times gamma j j i plus gamma m m i. Well, um, this uh, index of j and, and m, they're both dummy indexes, so we could rename this to m. And that means these two terms are the same. They're equal. Therefore, we can add them together. And that's going to give us uh, this expression. It's equal to 2z times gamma m m i. And that, then, is uh, the partial derivative of z with respect to zi. It's simply this expression right here. Okay, well, what we're really trying to do is to find the partial derivative of our volume element. So that is um, the partial derivative of the square root of z. That's our volume element with respect to zi. Well, that's going to be equal to 1 over 2 times the square root of z times the partial of z with respect to zi. And now that we have this relationship over here, that becomes 1 over 2 square root of z times 2z gamma m m i. And finally, that gives us the result we want. Let me clean this up and cancel out some terms here. The partial derivative of our volume element z with respect to zi is simply equal to the square root of z times gamma m m i. This, then, is the result we've been looking for. We'll make use of it later on, but for now we'll end this video with a brief review. What we did in this video was to introduce a new element called the volume element, and it's the square root of z, where z is the determinant value of our covariant metric tensor. Now the volume element is not an invariant object. It's not the same for each coordinate system. And we showed that it transforms using this factor, this uh, absolute value of our Jacobian uh, determinant right here. And we said that uh, the volume element in tensor calculus plays roughly the same role that the Jacobian does in other disciplines. All right, we then went on to demonstrate what the uh, volume element looked like in each of our sample coordinate systems. And then we derived this relationship. It is the partial derivative of our volume element with respect to zi, and it's simply the volume element itself times this Christoffel symbol factor here. Um, this is noteworthy that there's a contraction here. These two indexes are contracted on the Christoffel symbol. We're going to make use of this relationship in future videos, starting with the next video, where we derive the Voss-Weil formula.